time it takes for WSR88 to keep volume skewed. And even if you know where the tornado is, um, you're also dealing with influence. Tim Marshall talked about this, this idea that the storm at 70, almost 100 mile per hour influence, that if you're trying to get east away from this thing, you're going to have a hard time, especially in a four cylinder cobalt. There's the uh, velocity at that same time. It's moving about 50 miles per hour now, that tornado. So now they're on highway, well, about to highway 81. Dan Robinson is in front of them, and he gets this image of them um, as they are going east on rear. And there's there's a cobalt, and they're having the uh, they're having some conversation about what to do. Tim says, "So this is the highway." Carl says, "Yeah." Well, we're just going to have to. Carl finishes his sentence. Just keep on going. They knew. As with Dan Robinson, they thought they might be able to. They were going 50 miles per hour. If you look at the at the coordinates where they've been the whole time, do, do the math. They were going 50 plus miles per hour the whole time, and they still weren't getting ahead of it. Tim is voicing frustration. How is this thing it's supposed to be going 30 miles per hour? But it was going 55 at this point. This is what the stop sign looks like at Rear and Highway 81. This is what they were looking at before they made that fateful decision to go east. At 6.35, just before Alphadale Road, they realize uh, that they're in a bad spot. This is where they are. At this point, the rain curtains, according to Dan Robinson's video, uh, are already beginning to develop. They're already in the outer circulation. The low-level mesmer has already crossed over them. And at this point, Dan Robinson is only 300 yards ahead of them. That's, that's the margin that he had with them. So he can see them. He doesn't know that, that they're behind him, but that's where he is. And I don't know what Tim was seeing as he looked down to the south, but based on the size of the condensation funnel, it was probably only a half mile from him when they, were, when they came out of the rain on Alphadale Road and realized where the tornado was. So for the next 90, I think it was 93 seconds, they went as fast as they could to the east. The unfortunate thing is they were in a four-cylinder cobalt with 70 to maybe over 100 mile per hour winds buffeting them from the east and northeast. And so they were having trouble. In that time period, between the creek where it appears they were lifted, um, from, from the bad spot place to the, the creek is about 93 seconds. I did the calculations on that, 0.75 miles roughly, about 27 mile per hour average speed going there. So they had gone from 50 miles per hour in the previous part of the chase down to 27 miles per hour. Carl says, now I see it. Well, maybe I don't. Tim says, it's like it's just a bunch of rain here. Even these most experienced chasers couldn't really identify what was going on here. And so as they're looking to the southeast, this is what the kind of field that they would have seen. And I don't know when they saw the tornado. That's the direction. And Tim says, and this is the very last part of the video, he says, in fact, keep going. This is a very bad spot. At about I believe it was 6.20, see what the time was, 6.22.18 is the last view that Dan Robinson had of, uh, of the, the vehicle for his head and uh, the condensation over time. He was only a quarter mile down the road. This is the view, the last view that they would have had before they were enveloped by condensation. Based on the Doppler and wheels, velocity data, they were able to identify a sub-vortex um, that was in this tornado. Um, this happened sometime after um, they were enveloped by the condensation. Remember that was about 6.218. This is a, about a minute later. A sub-vortex uh, had a long lifespan, 90 seconds at least. Um, and incidentally, I didn't realize this, but this was the same sub-vortex that had killed Richard Henderson not 45 seconds earlier. And it also hit um, Zach Flanagan and Chip Leggett. They made it. They had airbags on all sides of their vehicle. Um, Chip's girlfriend was ejected from the vehicle. She survived without injury. But uh, Richard Henderson, unfortunately, was, was killed. This vortex at times was traveling over 150 miles an hour, translation velocity. And it moved north and then northwest toward Ruder. And when it hit Ruder, you can see it loop. And when tornadoes loop, 
that wind velocity that wouldn't have been maybe that big of a deal if it had been just moving on by really quickly, maybe in the blink of an eye, it remained at that location for about five seconds. The vehicle uh, was rolled a number of times, and it finally came to rest just northeast of the intersection of River and Radio. So that's the story of what happened, and there are a lot of lessons to, to be gleaned from this, and I'm not going to go into those here, but I think, as Chuck said, to honor their memory, I think one of the best things we can do is really chase safe out there, you know, to remember these lessons and not to let them depart from us. I know it's going to be really on our minds over the next year or so, but you know, 10, 20 years from now, I think we all need to remember this, remember this moment. But now I want to shift gears a little bit. We've talked about the sad things, and this is hard. This is very hard for a lot of us. But I want to start talking about the good things. Um, I want to invite Mark back up to the podium. Um, Mark, uh, I don't know if you had anything to say about this, but this is a picture of Mark with Carl and Ed and Sarah. Yeah, I think I think this may have been, uh, this is probably a couple years ago, right? Oh, it's there. Okay. It shows you how alert I am. All right. So, yeah, back in 2011. And, uh, you know, we got to know these guys over the years. And the first year we came to ChaserCon, we were the outsiders. We didn't know anybody. And I'm sure there's people like that out here in the audience right now. Um, but over time, you get to know people and you become part of the community, you know. And Carl and Paul and Tim are all about community. They love people. They love this convention. Um, I can just imagine them looking down on this right now and being amazed at what it's become. I mean, this is huge turnout this year. Um, so this was 2011, and I know last year, myself and Gabe and Sharon came out. Paul and Sarah weren't able to make it, unfortunately. Um, but a lion chair at the time we were here, we were with Paul and Carl most of the time. Um, so those were great memories. I know we spent a lot of time together, uh, had a few drinks, just a few. <laughs> and shared some great, uh, great chase stories. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult. Uh, and I know this presentation doesn't even do these guys justice. Doesn't even start to. Uh, but I think it's important to reflect on the memories you have with these folks, and they will be extremely missed. I know throughout the community, and certainly with myself and Gabe. I didn't know if you wanted to tell that story about Roselle. That's. It's a really great story, and one of the things that I'll always cherish. Um, of course, many of you were out in Roselle, one of the prettiest tornadoes I've seen. And, uh, so we're, I'm taking this picture. I had a horrible day with photography. I mean, got some people out here who had tremendous pictures, but this was about the best I was able to do. Um, but a really nice tornado, and uh, look who came by the road that we're on. It's the Twist X team. And apparently, where's Ed? Ed's right here. He apparently, you waved at us, right? Oh, yes, yeah, so, okay, just maybe he was pointing the video, he didn't wave at us, he was, cared about the tornado. <laughs> he knew it was us. But anyway, we saw these guys go past it. That's actually uh, my video there in uh, the tornado in, in the distance, but they, they passed us. Uh, of course, the tornado roped out, it was really beautiful. And later on that evening, uh, we actually uh, went to a hotel in Pratt, Kansas. And uh, I was really tired after, after that chase, and it was about 9 p.m. And I had to go back to my, my car to get something, and I looked over there, and Look who came in. It was Tim, Paul, Carl, Ned. And they pulled up, and they, well, they looked pretty uh, beat, too. And, uh, but I didn't really want to bother them, but I said, oh, it's, it's good to see them. So we went over there and said hello to them. And that evening, we had uh, an opportunity to hang out with them and talk about the next day and what the latest events and, and whatnot. Uh, but then in the morning, this was one of the times that I always cherish. That morning, we all got together to eat breakfast. And uh, Tim was there, and actually, to be honest with you, I'd only spent most of my time with Paul and Carl, but this was the first time I had really had an opportunity to really talk to Tim. And it was honestly like, he was like a kindred spirit. Uh, we were both a little bit of tornado nerds, I mean, I'm talking to a whole bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure we're all kindred spirits here. But, uh, yeah, we, we chatted about tornado dynamics. That's actually something I did for my master's thesis, and we chatted for goodness knows how long. We probably should have hit the road a lot earlier, <laughs> but we were kind of in the target area. But anyway, during that, uh, during that morning, we just had this opportunity that we felt was having sent. We felt that this was an opportunity. This was, of course, 30, uh, 12 days before what happened. And we had this opportunity to really say goodbye. We didn't know it was goodbye at the time, but we, this is our last memory of these guys. And it was so fun. 
It was so good to, uh, to have this moment of laughter, of conversation. And this was uh, the last picture, I believe, taken by Sharon Austin. Oh, Sarah took it. Okay, so Sarah Austin took this picture. And uh, I'd like to leave this picture up. Uh, and next, I want to invite Mike Nelson uh, to, to come up to the podium. He's, got, he's going to tell you a little bit about his relationship with the guys. And I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm the chief meteorologist at the ABC affiliate here in Denver. Uh, I've known Tim since the early 1990s, and uh, I'm very honored to be able to come up and just give a little reflection on all of this. Um, at the conclusion of my remarks, uh, Kathy uh, Samaras and Sal, uh, Carl's stepfather, would like to come up and, and say a few words. And I would just, before we even begin, just like to uh, salute their strength, the, the families. Uh, to be here today uh, for this, I know in many ways it's been therapeutic for them, and to see the love and respect that we all have for Tim and Paul and Carl, but it, it can't be anything that any of us can imagine how difficult. So, can we give them a round of applause?
But according to Jim, even better was when through Tim's work, he could get a hold of some Titan rocket fuel, and Jim would hear, hey, Jimbo, look at what I got to play with. <laughs> now, the fondness for fireworks became a family bonding experience as Tim and his brothers learned how to douse small fires, make fast household repairs, and honed their diplomatic skills as they often soothed the neighbor's nerves when mysterious flaming debris and strange flying objects fell from the sky onto their cars, lawns, and rooftops. In a related story, Tim also enjoyed blowing stuff up with his, quote, bunghole burning green chili burritos. <laughs> now, Tim began tinkering with things at an early age. His dad once brought a bunch of broken TVs home and piled them in front of Tim, and Tim promptly took them all apart and fixed them. Paul, thank you very much, took after his dad in wanting to learn how the things worked. And he once surprised his mom by taking the entire dishwasher apart. I'm not sure, Kathy, how that one turned out, if you got it all fixed back together or not. Paul loved computer games, animation, and photography, and he had a very unique eye for what would turn out to be an excellent picture. According to Tony Laubach, Paul just captured things that no one else saw. He made us look like heroes out there. As many of you know, Carl had a special knack for getting on the right storm. Growing up in Northern California, he loved watching the skies, especially lightning. Every chaser that I talked to said that Carl was never in a bad mood out there, even on those really long drives. These three men knew the risks and the rewards of chasing. Their passion lives on despite their passing. You know, sometimes I think about the pioneers 150 years ago when they traveled across the West in their Conestoga wagons. Can you imagine what these folks thought when they first experienced these giant thunderstorms? I can envision the cold, icy stare the husband might have gotten as his wife was looking at it as baseball-sized hail starts to pummel down upon them. going, we had a nice house back in Philadelphia, but no, you had to be Mr. Big Shot Farmer. And yet that pioneer wife realized the reason that they were there. And she understood the passion her husband had for exploring new places and discovering new horizons. Those monster storms have always been out there, but we have not, at least not in the numbers of people that now call Tornado Alley home. We chase because it's important for us to better understand these dangerous storms. The data that Tim, Paul, and Carl worked so hard for and sacrificed all to get is crucial to help us issue faster and more accurate warnings. We know that seconds save lives. We chase because we need to learn more about the location and the intensity of the strongest winds in tornadoes. Tim and his crew provided all of the wind pressure information to the public so that buildings and homes could be better constructed because we know that shelter saves lives. And we chase because we are all awed by the beauty of these storms. Tim, Paul, and Carl loved to chase storms in open country where the damage risk was minimal and they could simply admire the sheer majesty of Mother Nature. I have to think that even that pioneer husband must have peered out from the rain-soaked curtains of that wagon and looked out to him and said, Wow, this is really awesome. I wish I had a cheeseburger. <laughs> there we go. It's already hard. I just got this one. I can't imagine. I had known Tim for over 20 years. He was the most brilliant and the most careful severe weather researcher of them all. Tim, Paul, and Carl were not cowboys. They were pioneers. They were as cautious as possible about their approach to study these dangerous storms. Tim was featured in both of the books that I've written on Colorado weather, and I was awed by his knowledge and respect for severe storms. I first met Tim about 1992, when he had just started chasing. And in those days, he'd bring down to my TV station 
VHS tapes of the great storms that he had shown and, uh, and captured on the eastern plains of Colorado, and I would use those on the air. A couple of years later, Warner Brothers actually invited Tim and I to free screen the movie Twister together. And it was so much fun. Uh, I remember Tim saying he thought it was really Hollywood and kind of overdone it, but he thought it was, was great fun. It was a, a different tornado for Tim, but still a Hollywood tornado that inspired his interest. And many of you know that the Wizard of Oz fascinated Tim. Not for the flying monkeys or the witch or anything like that. He liked that tornado, which was fashioned, you may not know this, from a rayon stocking at the time. Tim wanted to see real tornadoes. It's amazing now to see how chasing has exploded in popularity. In 1998, the first chaser con was pretty much just Tim and Roger and a couple of friends in Tim's basement watching videos and eating pizza. And now, look around what we've become. If there was anyone that could be called the gentleman of storm chasing, it would be Tim. He was iconic among chasers and yet was very humble and sincere. When our seven news crew traveled with Twist X two summers ago, our cameraman, Brad Bogan, was amazed at the reverence that other storm chasers had for Tim. Brad mentioned to me that all the other chasers would be around their vehicles chattering away about going north or south, which cell to concentrate on, where the mezzos were going to pop up. And when Tim spoke, all the other conversations would cease. They hung on his every word. I never had the privilege to witness a tornado by their side, but I lived vicariously through their amazing pictures, videos, National Geographic articles, and seminars. One of my favorite memories of Tim actually goes back to before he had the probes and all the gadgets, he just had his camera. He was showing us the behind the scenes view of the glamorous life of a storm chaser. Tim was holed up in some cheap motel somewhere in Kansas and was showing off his room. He's got the camera, he's kind of walked around. As he narrates the video, he walks over to the wall and he zooms in on an 8 by 10 framed picture of the actor Michael Landon. It was autographed and beside it on the wall was taped a little bitty sign that said, Michael Landon slept here. <laughs> then Tim moves the picture off to the side to show it was covering a great big hole in the drywall. <laughs> Another memory that I have of Tim was the first year that he invented the turtle. Uh, it's a storm chase video that features a large tornado in the background. Tim hefting one of these 40 pound turtles in the foreground and the videographer is filming and narrating. Tim is struggling a bit with the, uh, with the, with the device because the roads are wet and And as the tornado looms larger in the picture, you hear the cameraman, uh, one of his former chase partners, Brad Carter, say in a pitch, somewhat, somewhat alarmed voice, hurry, Tim. Tim, struggling with the thing, is walking along and he goes, I am hurrying. The cameraman then goes, hurry faster. <laughs> you know, when Tim first showed me one of the probes, he explained to me how he designed it. He mentioned that the real name was the HITPER, which is an acronym for Hardened In Situ Tornado Pressure Recorder. He said that he preferred to call it a turtle to that big mouthful. And being in TV, and so basically in marketing, I kind of thought about it. And I thought, well, Tim, maybe you just need to tweak that acronym a little bit more. Given the vast amount of time and effort that he put into deploying those things, he should have called them the Hardened In Situ Tornado Measuring Equipment, thus changing the acronym to the HITME. <laughs> No, Tim, Paul, and Carl were not cowboys, but much like the guy in that covered wagon, they were pioneers. Their creative minds, their inventive spirits have gone many miles to further our science and ultimately save lives. Tim probably saw a thousand tornadoes in his life, Paul and Carl several hundred. They always emphasized safety as their primary concern. They knew the risks, lightning flashes, flash floods, huge hail, traffic accidents, and of course, the tornadoes. In trying to understand this tragedy, I've been comparing what Tim, Paul, and Carl were doing to what astronauts do. There is an inherent risk in chasing tornadoes. 
just as there is in space exploration. Storm chasers and astronauts accept the risks, but try to minimize them as much as possible. Tim, Paul, and Carl would often call off a chase if conditions appeared to be too risky, just as NASA might postpone a launch. As we've learned today, the El Reno storm was a rare event, and a sudden and erratic movement put several chase teams in jeopardy. Any of those chase teams on that storm could have ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. It just happened to be Tim, Paul, and Carl. Why do we chase? We chase because we need to. We need to continue to learn how these storms work, how we can best warn against them, and how we can build better and stronger shelters to save lives. We will continue to chase. Tim, Paul, and Carl are owed this. Let us redouble our efforts to chase with as much safety as possible. Let's make sure that the legacy left behind by Tim, Paul, and Carl is one of continued scientific exploration. But chasers, let us also realize that it is not only your life that you are risking out there. Remember that if you lose your life, you will forever change the lives of those you love. We best honor their memory by continuing to learn, to share data, and most important, to be as safe as possible. I'd like to think that Tim and Paul and Carl now have the best vantage point possible to watch the skies. Chasers, you have a big job. Study your weather, have your equipment ready, do your homework, because from now on, Tim and Paul and Carl are going to be on every storm. For the families, they have a greater and more painful challenge. They're left to grieve and laugh and be angry that Tim and Paul and Carl left too soon. From all of us, we want to say to the families, thank you. Thank you for being so strong, so selfless. Thank you for sharing them with all of us. Tim, Paul, and Carl love their families, and they love the wonders of the winds. Much like Major Ballou, I believe that if there be a soft breeze upon your cheek, it shall be their spirits passing by. Thank you. Uh, 
none of us, and I'm trying to summarize 36 years here in just a few minutes, but none of us would have imagined that knew the, the dynamics of our two sons. That what Odd and I were exposed and learned after Carl's passing uh, about how much. We obviously, we didn't need any of you until after Carl's uh, passing. And we learned so much because for, for Carl, this was a seasonal opportunity. I guess he did it for 11, 12 years. But again, at this point, he's a middle-aged man. And uh, none of us would have guessed that Carl would have done something so risky. And, uh, but we knew how much he loved it. And what we wanted to do is thank all of you because he had the time of his life. And that's something if Otta and I gained from this, it was, he spoke of all of you. We knew the love, the camaraderie between all of you. And Otta and I have seen many of you for the first time. We knew that uh, Carl made a, a good decision. He, he followed his passion. Uh, you all made it very comfortable for uh, Otta and I, and I, I can't thank you enough. You're a, a wonderful group of people. Uh, Carl loved you, we loved you. So I'm going to perhaps go back and forth on a few things, but if there's one thing that most of what I would have prayed for and would have hoped from meeting all of you, it has come true. And uh, thank you for that. First, I do want to say, the Samaras family, we, we, we first met just <coughs> last night for an hour and a half. We bound, and, and that's for you know, your children and your sister and brother and all of it. There, there was an instant, there was an instant bonding, and um, that's it, that all helps. Um, if there was something that is the big surprise and what you don't know again about life, is in the early years, if someone was going to, we know was going to party, have a good time, that was right, and he's listening to this, and, and Eric, we love you, and we love your son, our grandson who's age seven, and hello, Gage. But uh, they know this, and Eric was the one who took you. You know, I'm hearing these things just blowing over Ada and I. Eric was the one who was the risk taker. You know, I, I just get married, and it's, it's Eric. We're at Heavenly Valley, uh, Valley in Lake Tahoe. Eric skis straight down. Carl was with us, and we did what people normally do, you know. <laughs> and he's waiting for us, the young one. You know, this is so just a daredevil. Carl had the, you know, his mother's, uh, you know, the Dodge Dart Slinger, the Science Six Edge, and by uh, Eric would be the one with the, the Dodge Charger. He had the engine all apart, you know. He, you know, he did all that, but Eric was more of the James Dean type guy. He, he definitely was into this. So, but I know we're here to uh, to focus with uh, with Carl, but their roles switched when they became. Eric is the one who settled down with the family, and we now have uh, our grandson, which is Seth Gage. And that's what really, I think, helped keep the family together during this. Uh, if there's something I have to say with any of you who uh, become a situation like we're in, just be yourselves. With us, we just keep in the family traditions going, and it's the toughest thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. That's what, in this case, Carl would want. Um, so Carl, he, we said, he, Carl was about, I better get into the academic with Carl. We hear about this party stuff, and, and see, but Carl had the tools, and that's where I wanted to go. In uh, high school, uh, in school, in uh, Carmel High, he was about like Victoria. Straight A's, he was with the, the brain nerdy group, you know. Like probably many of you. <laughs> for the presentations I heard. You guys are so far over my head. But uh, that was part of the joke. When I met, uh, you know, Odd and, of course, the two sons, I knew that I better be friendly sons right away because they would be way beyond my league, and they are, as far as academics. But uh, Carl went out to Berkeley, uh, economics, got his bachelor's degree, graduates. What do you think he does? 
typical Carl. Girlfriend, she's studying in law. He tutors her for the next, I don't know, one and a half, two years. Does he get the job? No, he's in, in here with class. So we got economics, now he's doing this attorney thing. <coughs> he meets, uh, makes a great, uh, great friend. We hear about Mr. Hollywood, just to clarify that. It's a, it's a friend, Jim. I can't recall his last name, but <coughs> he's interested in doing the you know, Hollywood thing. Carl goes down to Southern California. To my knowledge, he was involved in two movies. Um, my favorite one's about the Navy SEALs. Uh, the other, uh, Carl portrayed, I don't know, he was a cop killer, you know, I mean, it, but it's a cool thing. He was there at the last 40 seconds, a reenactment of this supposed story. The typical Carl, that's what I'm saying, his name is never mentioned. He's in 40 seconds, he dealt with the music story. You all heard about his interests, he has all these albums and everything. He collected with spaghetti westerns. Again, no mention. That does, stuff doesn't bother, bother Carl. What does he do next, um, Carl? He, you know, he had a number of uh, jobs, uh, things he was interested in. His full-time job in love uh, for Tahoe was um, the league, Tahoe Blue, or the league to save Lake Tahoe. For five years, he was the program advocate. Typical Carl fashion. He's going to speak to the Native Americans up in Tahoe. He learns enough of their language, he's speaking to them in their fluid language. He, at uh, one point, was the interim executive director for that. Um, I have to switch back to childhood because that's the time that I spent, was able to spend quality time, you know, year after year. I should mention um, his father, uh, Bob Young. There was the three of us that raised our two sons. We coined the phrase, Husband-in-law, we did the holidays together, we wanted to keep the family together. He was a great, wonderful, special uh, relationship. So Carl's involved in other things that now he's interested in uh, meteorology, atmospheric sciences. There's a lot of fancy names I can't pronounce them. Don't ever ask me to spell any of that. But he went to the uh, University of Reno and received his master's degree. It was uh, during that period of time that he met many of you and, uh, and Tim, and he hit it off right away. And uh, like I said, I just couldn't be more grateful for the bond that they had, and then to be able to Odd and I to see all of you, hear the different stories and the presentation. Remember, for Odd and I, this is all. In a, a different phase for Carl. We have so many other phases. And then, of course, to be with the Samaras family. Um, you know, I go back to childhood, uh, and then I can wrap it up, and then what our wishes are. But they were exposed between the two families, uh, Bob Young and his side of the family, and with Ad and I, he was exposed to, to travel, uh, the different interests. Um, Ad and I co-founded the Antenna Wildlife Society. You can look that up on the internet, but it was the two sons that were involved with the initial infrastructure, putting that up. They built the, uh, the first towers there for peregrine falcons, then the bald eagles, and now the organization is uh, doing the California condo for the central coast of California. The boys were there at the time. With Carl, I considered him, in the nicest way, a chameleon. Never bragged, he never did anything. He, he fit in anywhere. And we learned from being here, and this part, so, you know, that other phase of him, but there was so much more. And like I said, we, I'm not going to spend, you know, all the time, um, but because uh, that's so, so very difficult. But Carl had such a great heart uh, wherever we are traveling. Uh, Carl and I, we kayak everywhere. We did it. Very grateful for, for all those times. Um, but Ad and I did do uh, for his adult life, now that his passing, uh, we did establish for uh, a local community college at Lake Tahoe, the foundation. 
Uh, Carl was a science, of course, everything else. He was a science teacher. It was everything from extreme weather to uh, geology. The students, everyone loved him, so we established the, uh, the Carl Young Earth Science Scholarship for the, the students there. For the League to Save Tahoe, we established something there in his memory. Um, with the Van Tan Wildlife Society, I was totally in tears with this. They gave a call and said, you know, we always, the biologists there and the interns, they didn't listen to the local news. They always called Carl. They had his direct line. They called Carl. So now that uh, Carl is uh, no longer uh, available for that, um, they, our building will be up by the end of this month, but uh, a weather station, they're going to name it the Carl Young Memorial Weather Station, and it's all overlooking the, uh, the Congress Center. So that will be up on the, the internet. So in closing here, I can't audit and I cannot thank you. I know Carl is with us. I can feel him. I can feel the presence definitely of, of Tim and Paul. They're all here. And I knew it was going to be fine. Obviously, we're nervous. We have the jitters. And I didn't present anything because I didn't know I was going to speak. But I definitely had to come up and, and thank all of you. Um, guys are wonderful and I can see why um, he was involved with this. Now, as, the, uh, as a parent, and now we're all part of the same extended family, I understand or we understand that there are better tools, things that are available instead of having this five to ten minute period that you're waiting on your fancy radar stuff, you have uh, the equipment available that perhaps brings it down to 30 seconds. To me, it just makes sense. I think, you know, the technology's there, whatever it takes, raising money, whatever. Let's put them up. It's not only for your lives, but the, the citizens. I mean, like I said, I can't imagine someone going to war and having to wait 10 minutes to get a report. You know, I mean, we know the military's using it. You know, when ass has been using it, you storm chasers to have it. So, if I did have one wish, and that is to wish all of you safe, continue what you're doing, uh, we can truly appreciate it. You brought out the best of Carl, and uh, continue to advance the science. And uh, you have saved hundreds of lives a year, I know it. But uh, save yourselves too and the citizens that you're serving. So that's that's it for me. I'd like to pass it over to, to Kathy again. Thank you so much.
my husband and my son every day. Um, but I also feel their presence and their strength, and that is why I'm able to be up here. I'm that I'm still able to smile, and I can see the love, and I can see um, my husband and my grandkids every day. I'll get a little glimpse of them. My little grandson has started tinkering with things, <laughs> and I'll go, there he is, you know, he's trying to learn electronics, he's trying to learn how to fix weather or something, you know. Um, and I see my granddaughter, and I know that we are going to, we're going to get through this, and it's because of your love and your support, and because you've become a family to us. Um, I really want to thank Roger and Karen because uh, I didn't want to come to this, <laughs> but the love and support that you've given me and Sal and Ada and my daughters and all of us is just, it has, it's helping the healing, it's helping us through. And so I want to thank everyone, all of you, I know that it's, it's not cheap to come out here, that it costs money, it costs time, and you spend a lot of that coming here, and I appreciate everyone that comes out here, and Corey for doing all this, figuring out all this stuff. Um, Roger's kind of had double duty this weekend of not having Tim up here, and he's done an amazing job, and um, anyway, but I guess that's what I needed to say, that you're my family, and there's so many people I need to thank, I, I couldn't start and stop. So, um, anyway, um, they are here with us, and I do feel that. So, I guess we need to get on to video night. <laughs> Thank you. 